Good morning or good afternoon or wherever you are anywhere in the world. So welcome to GPS. I uh, hope you've begun to see us uh, week to week, but if this is your first time, this is God's prophetic surprise. And we're going through the book of Revelation, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And uh, Dr. John Pauline from Loma Linda, Pastor Sarah May from our church at Garden Grove, youth pastor. I'm Pastor Dan at Garden Grove in Orange County here in California. So we're here at LBN, and we just love doing this. We are doing Revelation chapter 2. If you want to catch up to us, find a Bible. We finished, uh, or mostly finished, a discussion on the role of sexual immorality that is in these churches. They were, they were unhappy with the teachings of Balaam, of the Nicolaitans, of Jezebel, for teaching, allowing sexual immorality and food offered to idols and all of that. And, and Jesus just says, I wish you would take a stand. You know, he says, I have this against you in verse 20, chapter 2, verse 20. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel. So I think he means you shouldn't be tolerating. You should take a stand. And sometimes you lose your nerve. Parents, you know, lose their nerve. I'm the oldest of four sons. And we think my parents lost their nerve by the time they got to the fourth one. You know? Oh, no. Because what they had rules about us, somehow they were not doing with him. Come on, come on. Got to be fair to them. <laughs> you know, uh, you're here in healthcare teaching and residency and medical school. Uh, there are those who would say, okay, I had to work 24 hour shifts. I had to, so now so should you. And they see it being, what, come on, you know, hold the standard. What uh, if Jesus were to write this message today? Mm -hmm. What would he say? I have this against you. You're, you're just letting this keep going on. You've already talked yeah. about sexual morality. Is there anything else that either of you would say, I think this just makes Jesus sad, and he would say, just take a stand. Stop it. Hmm. First thing that pops into my head, how many girls in the world today are named Jezebel? I, I'd be curious about that. There probably are a few, but not many. Yeah. Um, it, it says here about tolerating the woman Jezebel. Just an interesting sideline with that. The word for tolerate there is the word that you find in Matthew 18. And Matthew 18 is where the king forgave the 10,000 talent mm -hmm. debt, uh, but then the servant would not forgive his fellow servant. So that's actually the word forgiveness. It's a little stronger than just sheer toleration. Yeah. So there's a time to forgive, and evidently this was a time not to. It's just interesting that that word would be used here. Hmm. So the challenge with the church is, is they are allowing, tolerating, forgiving Jezebel for what she's doing. And uh, apparently Jezebel must have had the idea that uh, whoever this was, if it was a person or if it was a movement, it was, it was the idea of the deep things of God. You know, it says here in verse 24 that she was teaching the deep things of Satan. Hmm. That's probably mocking just a little bit. You so know, this, but this is she was saying this is the deep stuff. You know, the, the Gnostics in the second century were saying we're teaching God's deep secrets. Yes, yes. You know, and so she was evidently claiming to have deeper theological knowledge. She probably felt she was teaching what Jesus would be teaching if Jesus was there. So this is not just practice. These mm -hmm. were teaching. This was theology. Mm -hmm. And Jesus does wants that to stop. He wants someone to stand up against these teachings. Well, theology does matter. There are, uh, there are many issues that are not life and death, mm -hmm. but there are some that are. Well, and I think people use theology as a weapon. And mm -hmm. like that's what's so scary is, is you meet these people that are claiming God's love and claiming truth and claiming all this stuff, and then they use it to torture other people and to put them down and actually to push them, to make them feel so awful about themselves that they'll do anything to be distant from, you know, the God that we love and serve, you know? And so I think that's, that's actually almost more dangerous. I mean, people talk about it all the time, emotional abuse versus physical abuse, you know, like, Emotional abuse often causes a longer recovery process than physical mm -hmm. abuse, often, not mm -hmm. always. But I mean, those are things that go with you. And so, I mean, if you're using these words and you're using your theology as a weapon to torture people and to hurt people and to lead them in messy directions, like that's just, 
uncool. Go with that a little bit. You know, in early church and afterwards, the first two, three hundred years, there were all kinds of different beliefs about Jesus and his nature and the Trinity and all of those things, and, and groups and followers. And then slowly they hammered out creeds and councils. Then the creed became something that you had inquisitions about and, and terrible things. The Adventist church came out of a movement uh, that was kicked out of other churches. And so for how about 30, 40 years, they refused to have any solidity. And they, okay, they believe this, so that's okay. Mm -hmm. And then gradually there began to be the settling, okay, we have to say something about what we believe. And then what we came up with began to be used as a, as a barometer and a litmus test. Mm -hmm. How do you get that right? You know, here there's, there's some things we're supposed to take a stand on to say, you can't believe that. That is not okay to believe that about God. And when do you say, you know, this is what I understand, but you can see it a little differently and we can be church together. Well, an interesting little piece of history. I read a book recently called Jesus Wars. And it was all about the centuries where they were determining the nature of Christ and the Trinity and so forth. And there were whole wars fought over whether Jesus was God. You mean physical wars? Yeah, physical wars, whether Jesus was God, whether he was identical to God, whether he was similar to God. You know, those, you, you catch those fine nuances mm -hmm. between those three. Um, there were whole wars fought over that, and uh, one could make the case that the Orthodox doctrine was uh, proclaimed by the monks who had the most clubs. In other words, they'd, they'd beat well, each yeah. other up, and the, the, the ones who had more monks uh, with the billy clubs, uh, that's, that's what the teaching became Orthodox, and the other one became heresy. Which is the one where it's a homoousion or whatever? Well, exactly. One that's yota what I'm saying. And one's an Ho homoousios or homoousios. That's, that's sort of the difference between <laughs> anyway. identical and similar. And they had to have uh, a conference to sort that out. Yeah. One letter. Well, it, I often say the biblical answer to a lot of our questions is yes and no. Yeah. You know, is Jesus identical to God? Well, yes and no. Is he similar to God? Well, yes and no. I mean, it, human <laughs> language struggles oh, to define some of these things. Uh, and perhaps in some of those issues, a little bit of flexibility with people's understanding might be a good idea. But they, that, that they didn't have. They took stands. But to what degree were those stands worth taking? I think today we would look back and say they were worth it because it established the doctrine of Christ on a solid ground that hardly anyone questions today, and that's helpful. So where's right? the line? But with the that? process was an ugly process. You're a dean of a school of religion. Uh -oh. And there are rumors that there is a movement to have a body that will have a list of beliefs and that you will have to have a five-year five -year license that you have proven that you're orthodox enough to be a teacher of our young people. And you can understand the goodness of that. We want people to teach our young people truth. But at the same time, that's sort of counter to academic freedom and exploration of the spirit and... How do you balance that? Mm -hmm. Well, those, those are the very kinds of issues that, uh, that people wrestle with in the real world. That's right now. I mean, yeah. that's, I'm, yeah. I'm sure. sure you've written an email mm -hmm. or two or received some about it in the last few weeks. And I just have to say that I think I, one of the things that I've struggled the most within organized religions in general is being told what to think and like not allowing the process of thought to play out or the questions to be asked or the, the things to struggle with. I mean, like, I, I don't know how many times I've got my parents all riled up and at the end they're like debating my Christianity. <laughs> like, what, <laughs> what did you mean by this? And really it was just me processing it because I've been told the right answer and I've told this is what this means, this is why we do this, but... So how do you take this passage? There well, are some boundaries. Well, I agree there's some boundaries, but boundaries? again, it, I, I, what I tend to do when I study and when I think about how to handle different situations is, is I, I try to, again, look at the big picture. What are the things that draw me closer to God? What are the things I'm strong in? What are my temptations? And so when people talk about, like, what's the spectrum? Like, what's too far and what are you supposed to stand up for? Like, I don't think that's a blanket statement. I don't think anyone you might be fighting a totally different battle than I could ever fight. And if I tried to fight your battle, I would mess it up completely, you know, or it wouldn't mean the same thing, you know, whereas... 
But if this is the last day church, mm -hmm. it is saying that uh, we're going we're gonna to face issues that may be very subtle, mm -hmm. but have, have consequences. And they reflect yeah. God, and they are not... They're going to be a, a, a counter to the truth about God that God wants to hear all over the world. All right. And how I will we have yeah. the courage to stand up and say, okay, I'm going to go against the grain here and be a reformer and yes. say, I think all it's right. education. Let me, let, me, let me tackle that head on. <laughs> how do you know when to take a stand? All right. One strong piece of evidence is where scripture is clear, where it fits the situation, it's clear. Everybody can see it's clear, and now you have a choice. Either you follow it or you say, I'm not going to do it. I know what's right, but I'm not going to do it. At that point, you have to take a stand. Um, another is where people of goodwill who are following God, who are listening to the Spirit, come to a consensus. I don't want to be the outlier now and say, well, I'm going to do it my own way. Uh, when God brings the people to a consensus, that has authority. That's significant if, if, you know, the Holy Spirit works with groups. And that's uh, perhaps what happened even with the bully clubs uh, in the formation of the doctrine of Christ. It, it, it came to about as good a place as you could come given the philosophical issues of that day. I don't know how they could have done it better. Uh, so God sometimes brings the church to a consensus. Um, consensus is overwhelming majority? Yeah. You know, we uh, had a vote 17-4 last night uh, to build our basketball court. That's a consensus? Well, I, I'm thinking of a recent <laughs> action, a worldwide action that was 60-40. 60-40, I was thinking of that you too. See? Uh, does that, you know, does a 51% vote mean now the 49% have to absolutely give in? That God has spoken. Um, it, it, you know, if 40% of the church believes a different way, do they have to start their own church? at that point. I mean, what, what view do you have of consensus? I would want, as a leader of a faith organization like that, I would want us to be closer to consensus. And that may mean talking until we all see our way clear, that we say, okay, we're not going to agree on everything, but here's a place we can all live with. But, and that's what I was going to say, yeah. is, is I think that we just, I think sometimes we talk way too much, and I think other times we refuse to talk about it. Yeah. And that means that no one really knows why or how we got there, and then there's resentment and crazy things that come out. And so I think sometimes it takes the conversation and the mm -hmm. gutting it out in the vulnerability in order to be able to. When does to, it become a big enough issue then, you know, to do a reformation? I mean, Martin Luther finally had to say, I, we can't be mm -hmm. with you people anymore. And then he began to say terrible things. You know, mm -hmm. these are popes and these are Christian people. And he just, you just write vitriol against them. Mm -hmm. uh, well, where Paul, does it stand? Uh, Our church leaders, yeah. I put a question on my sheet yeah. here. I said, the church leaders will say, no, unity, unity, unity. And that's one of mm -hmm. our fundamental beliefs mm -hmm. is that the church should be unified. Mm -hmm. But if you have the unif unification of the church be the ultimate value, there would have been no reformation. There would have been no Adventist church. So where is the time where you say, okay, I believe in unity, but this is more important now. If it's a Holy Spirit-driven unity and, and there's a true recognition, hey, we've got different viewpoints on various things, but this, this we can all agree on this. That's what I mean by consensus. Uh, where you have a managed unity, an enforced unity, then it all comes back to the picture of God. Yes. Is yes. God someone who wants an enforced unity in the universe? Is that going to safeguard the universe forever against sin, mm -hmm. an enforced unity? Or is it a unity that's born out of people learning that God can be trusted, learning that His Word can be trusted, that his point of view can be trusted. Uh, that becomes the crucial thing. For Luther, I think the whole challenge was that there were large segments of the church, as had been the case uh, beforehand with Judaism, uh, large segments of the church had come to the place where human actions had more to do with salvation than God's. And Scripture is clear. Salvation is about God doing what we can't do. And the moment you say, well, we can do in the area of salvation, um, that's where you've got to take a stand. Because if you don't, uh, you're going to have a whole lot of people running shipwrecked trying to be what they can never be and undermining the gospel. 
you feel like there's places where God is wishing we would take a stand right now and we're just scared or we're afraid of our job, our reputation? I think the challenge today is that when you ask that question of 10 people, you might get 11 different answers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here's the place where we got to take a stand, you know? And uh, we live at a time when society is changing so rapidly that the message that hit home with power 10 years ago, people are scratching their heads. They have no idea what you're talking about. And trying to articulate truth in a way that is compelling to large numbers of people is more difficult now than it was when I started out in ministry. Absolutely. And so at a time like this, listening may be one of the most important traits. Right, and I think also we have to be very aware that we have so much information at our fingertips hmm. that that changes our thought process within religions or like basic living. I mean, you look at what's going on around us and I can, I can say, oh, Christians believe this, and then I get 75 things immediately. So like I don't often have a discussion about it or even an experience about something or even a full thought process. Because it's harder to find that consensus that he's talking about? Yeah. Because I mean even within Adventism or the Christian church or you know whatever it may be, I mean you can get, you talk to 10 people and like you said you get 11 different answers and I think it's hard to know what to fight for because there's so many causes and there's so many things going all at once that it's not like back in the day when, you know, that here's our main goal as a church. This, we're going to start going to church on Saturday. You know, that's like a one thing as opposed to here's this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem. It's hard, it's hard to know. We, we had a, I was thinking about Excite 98. Do you remember any of that? When you were, you were at Andrews. Dwight came out and spoke for it. We had a huge deal. Two young girls organized us, Shasta and uh, Jennifer, now the student life up at PST. And so we had all these young people and Friday night and uh, 11 o'clock at night and I came to these two young girls and uh, she said, I'm crying. And I said, what's wrong? Pastor Dan, there's this guy speaking over here in the chapel and he's ranting, he's speaking against us, he's speaking against our speakers, he's ranting against it and it hurts. Mm -hmm. it, was one, it was our own person. He, they'd invited him to speak, but mm -hmm. he was now trashing this program. Very controversial pastor. So I went in there and he was. And he was damning the drama, he was damning the program, and he was damning everything, and damning the people that invited him to come and speak. And he had like 75 or 100 of his followers there. So about 11.15, I finally stood up, and I, I, I asked the meeting to come to an end. I said, you have not followed Matthew 18. You mm -hmm. have not talked to these people. You're not listening to them. You haven't gone and given your concerns to them. And I really feel until you have followed those procedures, not appropriate for me to allow this to go on and I really wish you'd bring this to an end. Difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then to watch 75 people walk out the door and just glare at me. Mm -hmm. Now that pastor got fired eventually and is out of our system. He created trouble all over the world but no one knew that at that point. Boy I don't know that I would do that again. That was really hard. Really really hard to know. Mm -hmm. But boy the young people thanked me. They said Pastor Dan someone stood up and yeah. said, this is not okay. And I think that you kind of know the battles you're supposed to fight. I know which battle, well, no, I don't, not always. But a lot of the time, like, I'm like, that is not a battle worth me fighting. You know, and I right. know that. And I'm like, it's not my battle to fight. It, it's not a thing for me. I should not be easily offended, Matthew. Right. First Corinthians but then there are other times where there's injustice and there's something crazy going on and your gut is just ripping you up and you're just like, you know what, I can't stand by this. Like, I don't want to, like, if I died tomorrow, would I be proud that I didn't say anything, you know? And I think those are the moments where, like, you have to pray about it, you have to think about it, you have to, like, focus on it, assess the situation, see, you know, if you've studied, whatever it may be. And then if it's if you truly feel like that's what you're supposed to do, then do it. I mean, that's how great people are, you know, like recognized. Those are the people that have made differences in our history. And, and that's why they're sitting during national anthems and locking arms and sometimes, trying to get a conversation going to say people should not be walking down the street and all of a sudden shot dead. And yeah. sometimes, sometimes people stand up for the wrong thing and it's stupid, but at least it starts a conversation and other people then know what they're believing in suddenly. I mean, there's so many times where people, one of my friends has done something so idiotic and I'm like, well, now I at least know I never want to be associated with that, you know, like, and at least I know the opposite. And so mm -hmm. I think there's something good about standing up. 
I like walked in. Uh, I walked into a Vesper program. A guy called me from New York. <laughs> told me he was something, something, somebody, turns out not quite right. And I walked in, and my church members were totaling up their payments to buy water filters Saturday afternoon, Sabbath afternoon, in our Vespers. And I said, what are you doing? I had to go to another service and then come back. Mm -hmm. And he was selling them water filters. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they were gonna buy six or seven and totaling up, and who was gonna pay how much to buy this group That's of them? That's so crazy. And I said, if I don't say something, they'll say, because we invited him they'll think I condone this. Mm -hmm. So I sucked up my courage and I got up in front and took the microphone and I said, I'm so sorry, I don't want to hurt anybody and I'm sure you're a very fine man. But we do, we would never have allowed you to come and sell water filters in our church on Sabbath if that's, I know that's what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And I said to everybody, please, you do whatever you want. But we do not endorse this, support this. And we would never have allowed this. And then watched my church members thank me afterwards. They were wondering, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And someone stood up. How many times have I should have stood up and I didn't? You know, right. I don't know. At all. I remember Mervyn Maxwell telling a story about Chamberlain, who was the Cartwright, you know, the circuit riding preacher, Methodist circuit riding preacher, went into a town and they were having a dance and so he sat there. One of the girls said, why don't you come dance? You should be respectful to the guest. So here he is a preacher in the middle of all these dancers and he said, before I do anything, I always pray. <laughs> Pulled her down, kneels on the floor, and prays for a long prayer. By the time he was done, the dance was over. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my word. When, when do you do it and know that God has called you to this moment at this time? Obviously, lots of people have come to me who thought they were called of God to stand mm -hmm. up. But I don't think it was God at all. You know, They were way off in French. Yeah. But here, clearly, yeah. there was a time. Well, I yes. think the, the, the answer to this is probably right in this text. And I think of verse 29. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Yes. You're yes. not going to get consensus by politics. Mm. I think that's pretty obvious uh, these days. But the Spirit can build consensus. If we spent more time in prayer, and more time listening to the Spirit, I think consensus would become possible. And it takes time. Like the Excuse Quaker, me. the Quaker just sit there waiting for the will of God. It takes time to, to see positive change happen in any community. It takes um, self-sacrifice. Mm -hmm. People willing to give up a little piece of maybe what they thought was their turf, mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah. But the Spirit uh, can, can motivate that kind of consensus. I think that's incredibly true and I think the verse right before it also says I will also give him the morning star and I think sometimes it needs to get to the point of utter darkness and like loss of hope before people see that twinkle and like have something that is worth standing up for and worth going forward for so mm. I think that there's that I might just be making that up but that's no I like that <laughs> I, I, I like that I'm, you're I'm the looking nerd at that. here I don't know what's going yeah, I'm, on I'm looking at that because it, it recalls to me I think it's back verse 19 these two may be connected in an interesting way it says I know your works your love faith and service and patient endurance and that your latter works exceed the first ah. so you have this church which is in a really dark place Mm -hmm. uh, you may have noticed that the t whoever has an ear, let him hear, is swapped out in this one. In the first three churches, it comes before the promise to overcomers. Interesting. Now it switches to after. And the next four churches, it's after. And I've only heard one good explanation of this, so I'm going to run with that. Uh, I think it was Walter Scott, of all people, <laughs> uh, actually wrote on this, and he came up with a suggestion. He said, you know, the first three churches, the majority is faithful, and the Nicolaitans and Balaam and stuff, they're the minority. But with Thyatira, the faithful ones are in the minority, and it continues that way the rest of the way. You know, Laodicea doesn't find any faithful ones. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, Scott suggests that whoever has an ear, let him hear, is addressed to the whole church in the first three, but it's switched to the last place because now it's only addressed to the faithful ones in the church. Whoever has an ear, let him hear. In other words, there are people in the church who just aren't listening to the Spirit. Right. 
and therefore cannot hear the message of Jesus anymore. What's wrong with that? Good, 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 good. Yeah, okay. well, it's, it's the best explanation I've heard. But that in the uh, commentary. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I will. That's a win. That's where I got it from. Yeah. <laughs> from his commentary. <laughs> but I think, you know, coming back to what Sarah said, uh, this church is in a really dark place, and yet it says your last works are greater than the first. Mm. And, and notice, by the way, uh, notice what the church is good for. Verse 19, I know your deeds. He defines it as four things, love, faith, service, perseverance. Three of those, by the way, are in Revelation 14, 12, God's ideal remnant at the end of time. Mm -hmm. So Thyatira has several qualities that will be characteristic of the ideal church at the end of time. All of these are churches. Jezebel has got no probation anymore. She's done. You know, God is done with her. But there's still some hope for those who have followed her. Hmm. There's still hope for the Nicolaitans. Repent. Yeah, there's still hope for, uh, for those uh, who have messed up. There's hope for Laodicea. If I stand at the door and knock, if anyone answers the door, I will come in. So uh, the neat thing about it here is that the churches are messed up, mm -hmm. but God hasn't given up on them. Right. Finished one last minute on, he says at the end here in verse 26, he is going to give the group that overcomes authority over the nations. These are people that have struggled, struggling church, fighting these battles, but they're going to have authority and they're going to rule with Christ, with a rod of iron, all of that, from Psalm 2 verse 9. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about the thousand years, we're going to reign with Christ, we're going to judge with Christ. What is this authority? Mm -hmm. What do you make out of that? Well, some translations say power, but there is a Greek word for power that's dunamis, you know, like dynamite. <laughs> uh, and there's a Greek word for authority, and that's the one here, and it means a right to rule. You're the mm. legitimate ruler. So how will we rule? What does that mean yeah. to rule? Well, the legitimate ruler of this earth, from God's perspective, is the son of David the Messiah. Yes. And Jesus includes, evidently, in his rulership, those who are in relationship to him. Sit at the right hand you of see, God. You uh, see chapter 321, uh, you know, they will sit with me on my throne yeah. as I sat down with my father. See chapter 7, they're before his throne day and night in the temple, etc. So uh, they'll be kings and priests. Mm -hmm. So Revelation holds out the idea that the people of God, out of their relationship with Jesus, actually come into such an authority function. And I think, uh, to sum it up in just a sentence, uh, Jesus said, if you're faithful in little things, I will put you over something big. Very good, very good. Yeah. Amen. We gotta go, but boy, it's been fun. Uh, who knew Pergamum and Thyatira would have this much richness in it? So next time we will go to Sardis and uh, the church that uh, they said, you have the reputation of being alive, but you're really dead, wake up in Philadelphia, on to Laodicea. We hope you'll come back with us, GPS, God's prophetic surprise. We are blessed to have you, and uh, we'll just uh, do Revelation together till we come to the end. God bless.